Um, I was on Facebook recently, and I saw this post that kind of made me stop and think for a moment, and it said, what celebrity would you genuinely feel sad for if you heard that they had passed away? Like, would bring you to the point of tears? And I thought, you know, that's an interesting question because typically when a celebrity passes away, obviously you feel sadness because somebody has passed away, but you don't take it personally because you don't know them. So, so who, who would matter to me? I, the person who had posted this said Gordon Ramsay. If Gordon Ramsay posted, like, passed away, that they would just be devastated. I was like, well, who do I care about? And I realized if Jackie Chan died, that would probably be one of the saddest days of my life, finding out, like the day I find out, like I see it, Jackie Chan has passed away. I, I get like teary-eyed thinking about it. Like, it would make me so sad because I love Jackie Chan so, so, so much. I think he's fantastic. And mostly because I really, really like his movies and I really like martial arts movies. I think they're super dope, they're super interesting and his are really funny, so he's got a lot going on. Action and comedy, perfect combo, and he does great. And when I was thinking about my sermon today, I was thinking about Jackie Chan, I was thinking about martial arts, and I realized that there's a common theme in martial arts movies. Typically there's like the underdog, who needs to train up and needs to get strengthened to take on like the really big bad guy and he needs to get to a certain level or he's already at a certain level, he reaches a low point and he has to like lift himself back up. But how does the main character do that? We always see the training montage, you know, the music plays and we see him working out, he's doing crazy things that don't make sense and he's getting better and stronger and bigger and everything. And I realized it takes discipline. It takes discipline to reach that goal, to be strong enough to take somebody on and win. And so what I want to talk about today is discipline in our own lives. And so my sermon title is going to be Fighting for Discipline. And not discipline in the sense of like, you did bad, so I'm going to punish you discipline. Discipline in how do we live our lives in a way that will help us reach the goal of eternity with Christ. And when I was thinking about discipline, I realized that people typically use the word self-control and self-discipline interchangeably. But when I was looking into this, they're really two distinct things. Self-control is a short-term choice when you say no in the moment. Self-discipline is habitual behavior, usually as a result of the things that you are showing self-control towards. You develop, you become disciplined when you repeatedly do something. So if I repeatedly say no to eating junk food, I'm going to become disciplined and say, no way, Jose, there's nothing that could shake me. This is, this is how I've trained myself. And another interesting comparison that I've heard is that self-control is no, don't, and self-discipline is keep going. So the things that you're saying no to, your, how you are disciplined allows you to continue to say no to them. So looking at a biblical perspective, I want to take a look at Daniel, who I believe was very disciplined and showed wonderful self-control. So let's go to Daniel 1, verse 8 through 16. And it says, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief official not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel favor and compassion from the chief official. Yet he said to Daniel, My lord the king assigned your food and drink. I'm afraid of what would happen if he saw your faces looking thinner than those of the other young men your age. You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. He agreed with them about this, oh, sorry, and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. It's a lot of scripture, so I want to take a little closer look at it and really break it down. The first part says that Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to him, to them by the king. So Daniel's short-term choice to say no to the food was reflecting his long-term goal of staying holy before God. And so he was able, because he had that discipline within himself to remain holy before God, he was able to make that choice in that moment where he said, no, I'm not going to take part in something that I believe is going to separate me from God. He said no to the lifestyle that was being put on him by the Babylonians. 
Another thing that's interesting is it says he asked the chief of staff for permission. I really, really like that he did this. It's really interesting is that he asked for permission. Daniel was respectful even when dealing with something that disagreed with his convictions. He wasn't obnoxious. He didn't raise up a storm. He didn't go and fight somebody about how it was sinful and evil and all of that. He remained polite, but he was rooted in his convictions. Further on, it says, Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. God was with Daniel in his decisions, and God made it possible for Daniel to resist the temptation to give in to the lifestyle that was being offered to him. And then even more further on, it says, but he responded, I am afraid of, or, but he responded, this is the chief talking to Daniel, but he responded, I am afraid of my Lord, the king who has ordered that you give, that you eat this food and wine. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed. He said, please test us for 10 days further on. The thing that I find here very interesting is that Daniel was not the only Jewish man taken from his home, but he was the only one who had decided that he was going to take a stand for what he believed in. At the same time, however, Daniel did not put others at risk in order to protect his faith. He did not concern himself with what others were doing around him or were not doing. He said, test me, test me and my faith in God and see whether what I say is good. And the other thing is that not only did Daniel only concern himself with his own behavior, he also didn't, he, con, he was concerned about the safety of the others around him, even those who weren't believers. He still cared about them. And the decisions that he made and the way he went about it was always aware of keeping people safe and only putting himself on the line. So given these things that I've kind of pointed out, what exactly can we apply to our lives? The first thing that I want to talk about is when we talk about self-control and discipline in our Christian life, what is our goal? Why should we be self-controlled? Why should we be disciplined to resist temptation, to resist sinful behavior? Daniel's goal was that he did not want to defile himself. He knew that. He said, this is it. I'm deciding right now I'm going to stay holy before God no matter what. Our goal, we can find in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. Don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. Now, everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. However, they do it to receive a crown that will fade away, but we a crown that will never fade away. Now, our, another translation that um, I've read is that, but we do it for an eternal prize. Discipline in our spiritual lives helps us achieve the goal of entering into eternal life with God. That is our end goal. And so we are able to make short-term decisions with our behavior and with our lifestyle that are pursuant and in line with that end goal. So when something comes up that tempts us, if it's sinful behavior, you know, something that comes up and tempts us, we're able to say, no, I don't want to take part in that. I don't want to be associated with this because I know what I'm going for. I know my goal is to be with God. And whatever I'm experiencing in this moment is insignificant because I see my future and I see a future where I am with God. And in order to do that, we have to have self-control. We have to keep ourselves in check and we have to say no to ourselves. I think it's very easy to justify things to ourselves. You know, if you're driving, everybody slower than you is like an idiot and everybody faster than you is crazy because why are you going that slow and then why are you going that fast? But you're just, you know, you're going just fine. So we have to really be hard on ourselves, really think and be honest with ourselves and say no to ourselves because it's very easy to just go a little wishy-washy when we are looking at ourselves. And continuous self-control becomes a habit because we are continuously controlling what we're doing, and we are able to become disciplined to obey God's word alone. Another thing is that in line with remaining, you know, what our goal is, is not to compromise the goal. It's to not lessen the goal or to do things that would make it seem less valuable to yourself. When I was reading a Bible study on Daniel, I saw that one of the people commented and they asked, why did Daniel care so much about food? What an insignificant thing. It's just food, just eat it, just move on, live your life, be happy. It's just food. But 
Daniel saw this food as for what it was. Typically in that time, the Babylonians may have sacrificed it to idols. They may have set it apart to some other god that didn't even exist. They may have had other kind of rituals that they practiced with this food, and Daniel knew that. And he said, I don't want to be like the Babylonians. I don't want to live the way that they live. I don't want to do the things that they do. So even in this little thing, as simple as what I'm going to eat, I'm going to set it aside and set it apart to be holy before God because that is my end goal, is to remain holy before God. And nothing was too small for him to keep in line with God's word. And the thing with Daniel's situation is that it would have really been super, super easy for him to compromise. He was taken away from his home. He was taken away from things that were familiar to him. He was taken away from the Jewish priests. He was taken away from the Jewish leaders who were all telling them and teaching them how to live before God, constantly reading the laws to them, constantly reminding them the things that they're supposed to do, the things they're not supposed to do. And now he's in this environment where it's totally normal and perfect and okay to disobey God. In fact, to even act like God doesn't exist at all. And in the same way in our lives, we are in an environment where it is natural and acceptable that we would reject God's word, where it's often pushed on us to just forget about it. It's no big deal. Why are you even making anything out of it? But Daniel did not compromise even when he was removed from a familiar environment. And so that leads us to ask ourselves, when we are outside of the church, When we are out of the viewpoint of our pastors, of our leaders, of people who are going to tell us what's right and wrong, what kind of decisions are we making? What kind of choices are we making? What kind of things are we using to shape our lives? Do we truly have that self-control to be able to decide that I'm going to pursue God regardless of whether or not somebody tells me what's right or wrong? And that's what Daniel had because, because he... That was, that was what he resolved to do, was to continue to pursue God no matter what, he, what situation he was in. We need to pursue our goal and not compromise in the slightest and hold ourselves to a high standard. And we can look at Romans 12, 1, 2 to better understand this. And it says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Being a living sacrifice is constant work. And to have self-control when we're given different choices and different situations in our lives takes continuous work. To always say no when something is presented to us that is sinful or ungodly. And so it takes a lot of continuous, constant work in order to be that living sacrifice and in order to not compromise our goal. Another thing to think about when we are reflecting on our lives and how to be, you know, practice self-control and be disciplined, is that we're representing God. You know, even when Daniel held on to his convictions, he was respectful. He didn't put anyone else except himself and his faith on the line. He wasn't obnoxious. He didn't, you know, he didn't come at the Babylonians and say, well, you guys are ridiculous. You're making me do this. I'm a Jew. I can't do this. I'm going to go ahead and fight all of you. And then go ahead to his fellow Jewish people and say, how could you guys even be allowing them to do this to you? Why aren't you standing up for anything? You know, making a really big deal, making a really big storm. Daniel didn't concern himself with any of that. And I think that's really important for us to apply into our own lives is do not concern yourself with what people are able or unable to control in their own life. As Christians, we do have a responsibility to help one another, to point out when we're falling short, to lift each other up. But when it comes to self-control, that's in the definition. It's self-control. What other people are doing around you should not impact your own ability to say no. It's you. It's on you, and it's between you and God. And why I call this point representing God is that even when we stand for righteousness, even when we stand on God's word, there is no need to insult anybody. There's no need to fight with anybody. There's no need to cause anger and rifts and crazy conflicts between yourself and people who are non-believers. Because in that very moment, that is your opportunity to testify about who God is. And if you're standing there saying, well, I'm not going to drink because I'm a Christian. All of you sinners are going to go to hell because you keep drinking. 
they're never going to turn back to God. I promise you. I've experienced that. I've been in an environment where people have encouraged me to drink, and I've said, no, thank you. I don't want to drink. Why don't you drink? Well, I don't, you know, I, I'm a Christian. I, that's my decision. I've just chosen that I'm not going to drink. And then a person who has claimed to be a Christian standing right next to me saying, yeah, she's not going to drink because you guys are going to go to hell, and you're not going to bring her with you. <laughs> what? ridiculous absolutely ridiculous and then those people laugh those people laugh it off and they don't even take a minute to hear out really why I don't drink really why am I making these decisions because they've been completely shut down by somebody who later on goes and drinks with them but that's another story either way the point is what you're saying has to line up with what you're doing and there's nothing wrong with defending your reputation there's nothing wrong with living in such a way where you are concerned for the way that you are being representing Christ and his church, that is good. We should be mindful of that kind of thing. And here's why. Titus 2.8, let's dive in there. It says, your message is to be sound beyond reproach, so, ha so that the opponent will be ashamed, having nothing bad to say about us. I can promise you, if you speak a certain way and live another way, Nobody will ever be able to come to Christ through that kind of lifestyle. And that's our end goal. I'm not saying to protect your reputation and who you are just so that everybody can think you're good all the time. I'm saying that for the sole purpose of through a life that is disciplined and through a life that is able to resist temptation, we can say, listen, everybody, I want you to have a relationship with Christ. I want you to have a relationship with Jesus. And here's my life being consistent in the decisions that I make, being in line with scripture, I am able to say that to you and you can take me seriously because you can believe that the things I'm doing, I'm doing. And the things I'm saying, I'm doing. Because I'm representing God in everything. Even when I'm standing for my convictions, I want there to be an opportunity for somebody to come to God. So I'm not going to start fighting people. I'm not going to start angering everybody in the hood and trying to make my points proven. That's not, that's not going to help anybody get anywhere. And at the very end of the day, our self-control is only possible through Christ. And our ability, you know, despite our best efforts and greatest intentions, we can still fail. And I think those moments where we mess up and we kind of give into a temptation or into something that we've been fighting in our life, they can be really difficult because we always think, I've come so far. I've made it this far and here I am again, I've messed up, I've gone back to the thing I've been doing over and over again and I'm still, I'm still messing up. I still can't say no, I'm still struggling. But it's through Christ that we are able to have self-control, where we're able to think about, you know, what he did for us at the cross and, and the goal that we're going for and remind ourselves that we need his help every single day to live the lifestyle that he has called us to, to live the purpose that he has called us to, and to take that moment to say, God, I need you. I need your help. I need you to strengthen me. I need you to, you know, take my thoughts, make them centered on you. Take my body and my action and my choices and have them be centered on you so that when those moments of temptation come, I can say no. I can resist them, and I can continue to serve you and continue to be in relationship with you. And if we look at Titus 2.11, it says, for the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. That's the key. It's by the grace of God that we're able to have self-control, that we're able to resist temptations, that we're able to live a life that is disciplined for Christ so that we can live that example, so that people can look at us and say, wow, that person says they're going to do something and they do it. That person doesn't says they're not going to do it and they don't. And through that, we can testify and share with people who God is and how he loves them and how he saved them. So don't feel too down on yourself. If you fall down, if you make a mistake, God is, God is our strength. God is our way to live with self-control and to be disciplined. Amen.